Today we will be talking about the impulse momentum theorem. Before we really get into the idea of the impulse momentum theorem, we first have to look at what linear momentum itself is. Linear momentum of an object is the product of an object's mass times its velocity. In other words, the formula for it would be P, which is a symbol for momentum, is the mass of the object times its velocity. It's a vector quantity since um, Velocity would be a vector, so momentum would have to be a vector because you're taking mass, which is a scalar, and multiplying it by speed, excuse me, velocity, which is a vector. So the units would simply be the units of mass and velocity, or kilogram meters per second. All right, so let's see if we understand this. Which has more momentum, a kid on a bicycle or a train? And the answer is, it's an impossible answer without knowing the mass and the speeds of both objects. And the reason I gave you this idea is that a lot of people think that, well, a train would have much more momentum, but that's only if it's moving. So it's a product of mass and velocity, so you have to have both. All right, so how do we change momentum? You change mo momentum by applying a force over a time, like kicking a soccer ball. You're applying a force over a time. This force over time is called an impulse. Um, but is the force over time the same for the entire time of contact? In other words, does it stay at the same force while your foot is in contact with the ball the entire time? And the answer is no. Um, the force varies from a minimum to a maximum, usually back to a minimum again, um, as can be seen in the next picture. Here's a picture of a golf ball being hit with a golf club, and you can see that it actually deforms quite quite a lot uh, before it even leaves the tee. Uh, so you can imagine the force vary from some minimum when it just started contact with it to some maximum before it started releasing and moving off the tee. So, as I just pointed out, there's many situations where uh, the force is not constant, and I wanted to show you a quick graph of that. Imagine hitting a baseball with a bat, um, and the force is going to vary somewhere from a minimum when it first in gets in contact to a maximum, where it has maximum contact to a minimum. This is actually where it's actually touching the ball. Um, and you can see this force over time varies. So what is the definition of impulse? Impulse of a force is the product of the average force and the time interval which the force acts. It has a symbol j. Impulse has a symbol j. And it's equal to force, which is a vector, times time. So once again, this would be a vector quantity because force has a direction, so therefore impulse would have a direction. And what are the units? And the units are Newton seconds. Newton for force, seconds for time. All right, let's look at hitting a baseball again. Um, we know the force varies over time from some minimum where it first contact is at some maximum where it's maximally deformed down to some minimum again when it finally leaves the bat. We can understand that if this is a force versus time graph, then the area underneath this graph would simply be the impulse because it'd be force times time. But without the tools of calculus, we're unable to find an exact value. But we could calculate an average, which is shown by this line here. All right, now I'd like to actually derive the impulse momentum theorem. I'm going to start with Newton's second law, F is equal to ma. But we can substitute for acceleration since we're assuming a constant average force. So if we have an, um, a constant force, then we should be able to use constant acceleration equations. And I can make this following substitution. Okay, I could put in for a, I could put all this in. 
Once I substitute and multiply through by mass, I obtain this. And we're almost there. After doing a little bit of arranging of t rearranging of terms, I end up with the impulse momentum theorem. All right. I'll talk a little bit more about that now. When the net force acts on an object, the impulse of this force is equal to the change in momentum of the object. So here you have a net force acting over a time is equal to change in momentum of an object, some final momentum minus whatever you started with. This is the impulse, obviously the final momentum, and the initial momentum. So let's um, look at an example of this. Um, rain comes down with a velocity of negative 15 meters per second. Why negative? Well, if we count up as being positive, then down would be negative. And it's coming in at negative 15 meters per second. Hits the roof, and we have a mass of 0 0.06 kilograms per second hitting the roof. And it comes to a stop. We'd like to know what the average force is. So what is the average force? It would have to do with, we'd have to use the impulse momentum theorem. Because we have everything we need other than the average force. And we're going to neglect the, um, the weight of the rain. We're just worrying about the force of the roof on the raindrop itself. Okay. And here's our equation. But if it comes to rest at the end, this final momentum is zero. And we can rearrange the equation, make our substitutions, and notice that this is mass per unit um, time and the uh, rate that we were given is mass per unit time. So we're able to re replace this, these two terms with just one term, mass per unit time, times our velocity. And it comes out to be a, a force of 0 0.90 newtons pushing up. So that's what the roof has to do, pushing up to uh, each second to counterbalance the rain coming down. Now let's try another one. Now we have um, hailstones, hailstones uh, instead of raindrops. And if you realize with hailstones, when they hit the roof, they actually bounce back up. So if that's the case, I would like you to think about this. What would I have to push with more? The, um, the roof with the rain or the roof with hail? Um, and think about it. Which one would have to push back with more? force. The roof when rain hits it or the roof with hail. And assuming they're the same exact mass per unit of time, assuming the same uh, initial velocity, which one would have to push back with more? And hopefully you realize the answer is with hail because now you're giving it some final velocity that is greater than zero. So the change of momentum is going to be a lot greater. Okay. So not only, think of it this way, not only is stopping the rain, bringing it to a stop, but you're taking it and throwing it back as well. So that's a little introduction to the impulse momentum theorem.